Okay, so now we're going to perform an analysis of this uh, sparse matrix representation uh, sort of of the uh, reduction algorithm. So, uh, so what's sort of immediately obvious, if you will, is that you have two loops, sort of the outer loop uh, and the inner loops, right? And then implicitly there's also a loop where you do this um, um, sort of merge of two linked lists, right? So, so the main structure of the algorithm sort of involves sort of two nested loops. Right? Uh, sort of the outer and inner loops. And uh, the addition of two linked lists. So there's again another loop. So, um, so you know that uh, as an upper bound it's like to the running time, um, there is at most um, sort of is a, well the sort of upper bound to the running time is at most cubic um, in uh, the input size. So the running time is at most cubic in the input size. Which is of course uh, consistent with uh, what you would expect. It's like from the um, <coughs> from the it's like the, the usual implementation. It's like of the uh, reduction algorithm. Okay, so uh, so it should be clear that I mean the main advantage, if you will, it's like of the um, the sparse representation is in um, you know adding uh, two sparse columns, if you will, right. Um, so if, there, if most of the entries, so normally of course when you add two columns, it's the, uh, the cost of doing that is um, proportional to the, the size it's like of the columns. Okay? And, uh, and of course in the worst case, uh, when you merge two uh, linked lists with length up to that size, it's like the worst case is, um, is that you, you have the same estimate. But uh, in general, of course, it's like the number of non-zero entries uh, is much smaller, and that's sort of the sort of sparsity assumption. Um, and so in general, it's like this sort of uh, linkless uh, merge is going to be cheaper than adding two vectors, um, if you will, um, of, of the input size. Okay, and so it's so a big part of the uh, savings, it's like is in this, this part here. Um, and um, so if you want to sort of do a, a more careful analysis, then the other question is, uh, in some sense, when you have um, when you have to sort of you know run this inner loop as well, right? Okay. So to improve on this estimate, right? Uh, we define collision as an attempt to um, deposit the list L, right, that fails. Because uh, the entry is occupied. Okay. I should also say that uh, the other thing, it's like where, in some sense, you're saving a bit of time, uh, is um, that the linked list structure, it's like with the reverse ordering, uh, makes the whole question of finding the lowest one very, very 
uh, efficient, right? You just sort of uh, index the entry. Whereas in principle, if uh, if you were naive about implementing um, the algorithm that's like uh, in the full matrix representation, you'd you know have to search, if you will. It's like um, the you would have to search. It's like um, you know it's like each of those. Um, Column vectors is like to figure out what the lowest one is, right? So which is not quite as efficient. Okay. Um, so anyway, so so when you have this collision, that's exactly when you have to do this uh, um, addition, right? Okay. So each collision involves sort of merging uh, two lists. which takes time. Which is proportional to the sum of their lengths, right? Uh, so we already saw this. It's like when we discussed how you would efficiently merge lists is that you have pointers. It's like we scan through the list and then you sort of uh, insert um, appropriately. Okay. Um, which takes time proportional. the sum of their lengths. Okay, so that uh, should be fairly obvious. Uh, so the loop ends when sort of L becomes empty. Or uh, when the non empty sort of list L is successfully deposited. Okay, and so you can ask it's like, what do these? two cases represent, okay? So um, maybe let me just uh, write that up here because I think that's sort of an important issue. Okay, so. Okay. So let's see, so there's case one where um, L becomes empty. Right, and um, so this uh, sort of identifies uh, sigma J, right, as giving birth G class. Okay, so it, it sort of creates a cycle, if you will. Okay, and then case two, where sort of after the reduction L is not empty. Okay, so, so this. successfully deposited. All right, so this uh, identifies sigma j as uh, giving death. And if you recall, it's like uh, if there's uh, non-zero L at the end of this, right, then the lowest one is uh, the one where 
is sort of this um, is encoding the homology class, um, which was sort of destroyed it's like by um, adding sigma j. Okay. Um, and, and that interpretation again comes from our earlier discussion of the reduced matrix algorithm. Okay, and the simplex sigma i, right, um, where i is equal to top L, right. Um, is where is sort of the simplex um, which gave birth to that homology class. Okay, all right. Um, So that's, that's basically the main interpretation. And then, so for each of these lists, sort of r dot, well, r k dot cycle, right, uh, contains sigma k, right, as its topmost simplex and then similarly sigma k uh, is the topmost simplex in L and it collides the list uh, in R, K. Okay, and, and then again, it's because, you know, the topmost simplex is really sort of the one which encodes the lowest one, right? And you only really add simplest, uh, you only really add columns together, right? When you have, it's like that they have the same lowest one. Okay, so, so in particular, then it's always the case that you have this property here. So, you know, again, the, uh, the reason why adding, um, you know, it's like two columns, it's like or two lists, it's like where a sigma k is the topmost simplex in both of them, right, gets rid of this conflict, it's like uh, ha of having the same lowest one is, uh, is because you're in model O2 arithmetic, it's like, and when you add a one and one together, it becomes a zero, right? So. Uh, so in modulo to arithmetic, right, uh, adding these two lists sort of deletes uh, sigma k, right? So now the uh, the merged list now has a topmost simplex, um, which is uh, lower than uh, k. Um, 
and then this inner loop it's like uh, proceeds monotonically from the right to left right the inner loop proceeds monotonically Okay. All right. So, so this is the inner loop. This while loop proceeds from right to left. Okay. The outer loop proceeds from left to right. Okay. So basically, what happens, if you will, if you think about again. You can sort of see this from the interpretation, right? That um, these collisions can only really occur. It's like um, between this region where the simplex which gave birth to a cycle gets created, and then uh, you know, so that's that's really sort of that range. It's like of index values. It's like where you can have these collisions, if you will. Okay, so. And again, that sort of makes sense, right? Because in some sense, um, when you're computing persistence uh, and you're trying to do this reduction algorithm, it's exactly the, you know, it's like, um, you know, this persistent range, it's like where the uh, calculations uh, are going to be uh, changing. It's like when you've added, it's like that k uh, simplex and all the rest of it, it's like you won't see it because it's already uh, sort of trivial, if you will. Okay, so so it follows that collisions for um, a simplex sigma j, right, happens only Trees between I and J, right? Um, where, okay, either I is equal to one uh, if. Sigma J is giving birth to a new homology class. Or I is the index of the corresponding birth. sigma j is uh, resulting in the sort of death of a homology class, right? All right, so, so that sort of makes sense, right? That if you're creating a new simplex, then you, uh, you, know, you have to worry about everything potentially. Um, but if you're uh, sort of deleting a simple, oh, sorry, if you're creating a homology class, then you have to worry about possibly everything. But if you are sort of, you know, resulting in the destruction of its like homology class, then the only time you're going to have a collision is, uh, you know, up starting from when that homology class was first created. Okay. So, uh, and of course, in this later case, this difference between I and J is exactly the persistence, if you will, it's like of that homology class, right? So, um, Erase that. So in this, in the later case, the latter case, right, the sort of J minus I, right, is what we call index of persistence or the 
index persistence, sorry, of uh, sigma j. Right, uh, so now let's consider this in a loop for sigma j. So a collision at uh, entry k uh, sort of can happen only if uh, sigma k gives birth to a class. at uh, sigma L right before sigma J is reached okay so this means that, that the following we have the following ordering I is less than K it's less than L, it's less than J. Okay. All right. And then, um, so similarly, sort of uh, collisions during the inner loop for a birth dev pair, right? Response to so sort of birth death pairs. Sort of which are nested uh, sort of within this interval from K, this closed interval from K to L. Okay. All right. So, so you can then sort of inductively show that, uh, you know, you, um, <coughs> um, you can inductively show that obviously everything is then contained from the interval from I to J, right? Obviously, the interval from k to l is contained within the interval from i to j, right? So inductively, this implies that uh, the list of collisions contain only faces. Okay, uh, and the significance obviously of this is that uh, if you recall um, the addition of two linked lists, right, um, is proportional to the sum of the links, right? So this then gives you a bound, it's like on the, the lengths, if you will, it's like we show up here. Okay, so if you let uh, P be equal to dimension of sigma j, right, the number of such faces is at most p plus 1 times the number of indices. And this just comes in the facts, 
uh, fact that if you have a simplicial complex or you have, if you have a simplex of dimension p, they're only going to be p plus one proper faces, right? Because you uh, obtain a proper face by omitting one of the vertices, uh, and a p simplex has p plus one vertices. Okay, so that's that's where this kind of argument comes from. So all right, so if you sort of put all these things together, then what that tells you that is that the time to merge sort of two lists right, is at most proportional to this number, which is again uh, giving you an upper bound to the number uh, or to the length, if you will, of the <coughs> Of the uh, of the length list, right? So, so with all of this, right, the running time. is uh, at most, well, I should say, um, well, the running time of the inner loop depends on the dimension of the simplex. Uh, so the, inner term, the running time of the inner loop uh, for a P simplex uh, sigma j, right, is at most. P plus one times j minus i squared. Okay, all right, um, and right. So, so this this has to do with uh, there's a factor j minus one com coming to from the upper bound of the number of collisions you can have, and then there's a factor of p plus one times j minus one coming from the bound that's like on uh, the length of the length list, right? So that's where all this is coming from. Okay, um, yeah, and you know, it's like, um, so that gives you sort of a, a more precise estimate, if you will, it's like of the running cost. And as so you sort of see, it's like it has to, uh, a lot of that cost has to do with sort of how persistent, if you will, it's like the, uh, you know, the homology are. So um, what you typically hope in practical data is that uh, most of the, stuff coming from the noise is not extremely persistent, and the only ones which are persistent uh, are the ones which in some sense encode the, um, the real topology, if you will, whatever that means, um, of the, you know, the, the underlying space which you're sampling the point cloud uh, from. Okay, so let me just stop here for now.